Good evening and welcome to the July 17th City Council meeting. If you join me for a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Orlovsky, uh, roll call, please. Michelle Volk. Here. Lou Kellier. Here. John Bermel. Here. Dan Walter. Here. All right. Moving on to item number three, citizens' comments. This is an opportunity for citizens to raise any issues that they may have. You have up to three minutes. So if you'd like to be recognized, you can raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, we'll move on. Um, any additional agenda information, Mr. Miller? Nothing to my mayor. Okay. Now I'll move on to item five presentations, the first being the National Night Out Proclamation, and I believe the police chief will give uh, an overview. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Just a quick update on where we're at. I believe you're going to read an official proclamation momentarily, but uh, we are approaching the big night of Tuesday, August 1st, National Night Out this year. Uh, I would just point folks to our webpage. We do still have time to register for neighborhood parties. We have through the end of the week. So July 21st is our cutoff date for official registrations, but folks can go on there, uh, find out where to pick up materials. Some other questions get answered on the website, points of contact. They can also request a police or fire presence, and we will get to as many parties as we logistically can that evening. Uh, I looked earlier today, we're at 107 registered parties, so I'm sure we'll add a few more throughout the week, but we're looking forward to seeing as many folks as we can out there on August 1st. Thank you. Very good, thank you, Chief. And I'll now turn over to Council Member Walter to read the proclamation. Proclamation National Night Out 2023. Whereas the National Association of Town Watch is sponsoring a unique nationwide crime, drug and violence prevention program on August 1st, 2023 called National Night Out, and whereas the 40th na annual National Night Out provides a unique opportunity for Lakeville to join forces with thousands of other communities across the country in promoting cooperative police community crime prevention efforts, and whereas the City Council plays a vital role in assisting the Lakeville Police Department through joint crime, drug, and violence prevention efforts in Lakeville and is supporting National Night Out 2023 locally, and whereas it is essential that all citizens of Lakeville be aware of the importance of crime prevention programs and the impact that their participation can have on reducing crime, drugs, and violence in Lakeville, and whereas police community partnerships, neighborhood safety, awareness, and cooperation are important themes of the National Night Out program. Now, therefore, we, the City Council, do hereby call upon all citizens of Lakeville to join the Lakeville Police Department, Lakeville Fire Department, and the National Association of Town Watch in supporting the 40th annual National Night Out on August 1st, 2023. Further, let it be resolved that we, the City Council, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, August 1st, 2023 as National Night Out in Lakeville, dated the 17th day of July, 2023. Very good, thank you. We look forward to seeing everybody on the 1st. Okay, we'll now move on to the Finance Department mid-year report, and we have Finance Director Erickson. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. And, and it's not, okay, maybe I don't have to look at that screen. All right, so this is our mid-year report, an opportunity for us to, for me to um, um, bring you up to speed on some of the projects that we've been working on and some that we've completed and, and so forth. So first of all, I'd like to announce that um, and I sent out an email to you probably about two months ago that we had received the Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting um, for our 2021 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report, the ACFR, and we've received this for the past 34 years. So that was an honor. Some of the projects that we've completed um, with the presentation tonight, um, we will have completed the city audit as well as three other audits that we are fiscal agent for, the Lakeville Fire Relief Association, the Dakota 911, and the Lakeville Arenas. 
We've also worked with Dakota 911 and Lakeville Arenas on the preparation of their 2024 budget. And probably about um, eight or nine months ago, we had worked with Dakota 911 to come up with an allocation of their fixed costs so that Dakota County would take, um, be responsible for fees to cover the fixed costs. And they were at 16% the first year, and this year they're at 33%, and next year they'll be at 50%. We sold bonds in June. They will be closing this Thursday, 9.2 million. This is to cover the street reconstruction projects this year, as well as park referendum funding for multiple projects. And we maintained our AAA bond rating with Moody's. Some of the current projects that staff is working on is the 2024 budget for the city, as well as the capital improvement plan. And you'll see those um, items come to the city council CIP at the next workshop in July, and then in August, we will have the preliminary budget as well as the final components for the capital improvement plan. We're also working on the ERP that the council approved a contract with BSNA back in February and Andrews Technology back in February. <coughs> Laura City, one of my senior financial analysts, is um, the seat city project manager, so she is working directly with BSNA and our consultant, Barry Dunn. <clears throat> we anticipate a go live in September for financials and HR payroll, September of 24, and for utility billing in October of 24. And so we've already set up meetings to, um, to hold open houses with all of the departments to find out, get input from all of them on different setup options, as well as having a preliminary data extraction um, coming up in August. Also coming up will be the delinquent certification that will come before you in October. This is for utility, code enforcement, and false alarms. And one other project that I don't have listed on here, but um, is also a part of your consent agenda, is our financial metrics report. So I've been working with the uh, Finance Committee for the last year or so on putting that together. And so we're happy to be able to um, present that to you for adoption and approval. And we anticipate that report coming back to you on an annual basis to provide you some feedback on how you're doing on the various policies, the fund balance policy, the financial sustainability and resiliency policy, and so forth. So I hope that is of value to you. Some statistics on utility billing. You can see that we've increased our number of customers by about 26% since 2014 about almost 5,000. Utility payment, uh, the majority, about, well, I guess about 50%, not the majority, is paying by electronic check or ACH. Um, we do have significant credit card payments, and then the others pay by either check or cash. We have about 7,700 customers that have signed up for the e-bill. So even though we have about 23,000 customers, not all of them have registered with PSN, Payment Service Network, and even of those that have registered, not all of them have signed up for e-bills. So we continue to promote that, uh, especially as um, issues come up or they might have some connection with the WaterSmart, that there's a lot of value in being able to get your information electronically, and the WaterSmart tool is where they can look at their consumption. <clears throat> this is the number of customers that have signed up for auto pay, so where we um, automatically pull their payment on their due date from their accounts. Now, some individuals do not like that. They don't want to have it automatically taken out. They want to generate the payment, go out there and, and see what their bill is, and then set it up for a payment coming up. But we do have about um, 7,700 customers that have signed up for auto pay. We have quite a few accounts that turn over. Um, you know, homeowners sell their properties and so forth. So year to date, this year, we're already at 1,800 that we have move-ins and move-outs. So the current owner moves out and then a new owner comes in, or it could be a tenant. And so 1,841, that is counted as, um, as one transaction. So it's not 900 transactions or 900 move-outs is 1,841 houses have changed hands, or the, the, the people that we're billing, I should say. 
So that's pretty significant. It's pretty constant with what we did for the full years back in 2014, 15, and 16. It's on track certainly to exceed what we had done in 21 and 22. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of movement there. For accounts payable, um, you can see that we do generate a lot of electronic payments as well, about 42%. And the number of payments that we've issued is on track to match with what we've done last year. This next chart actually shows the number of invoices that we've processed. So you can see it's about 13,000 invoices already year to date. And last year we had a very high number. Um, we're certainly on track to be at about the same number of invoices as in 22. And then we have some upcoming retirements in the department. Um, David Lang, our senior financial analyst, he's been working in a part-time role for about the last year and a half. He will be retiring fully in September. And I am retiring tomorrow. And so I had to put a little fireworks <laughs> there. So I do want to take the opportunity to just uh, briefly thank all of you as council members and former council members um, for my time here the last eight years. I've really enjoyed it. It's, um, a council can make a big difference in how you can get things done. And um, I think you've been very open-minded and um, trusting and willing to look at things differently. So I've really appreciated that. Um, I also want to thank Justin and the senior management team that they've been very workable, enjoyed working with all of them. Um, my finance team, excellent staff, they've done great work and you see it come through whether it's on budget or CIP and audits and so forth. They've been a great team to work with. And certainly other staff, other department heads and managers and staff in all the departments, it's, it's been great to work with them, a great organization. You should be very proud of it. I've enjoyed working with all of you. So, do you have any questions on my presentation? <laughs> okay, but um, you can stay there for just a moment. So as you said, um, tomorrow is Geraldine's last day, and I, I just wrote something down. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything, but throughout your tenure, you have exemplified dedication, expertise, and commitment to the financial well-being of our city, and your leadership has steered us through times of economic challenge and also prosperity, ensuring that our resources were managed with the utmost care and efficiency. And your strategic vision and prudent fiscal management have contributed significantly to the growth and stability of Lakeville. Under your guidance, the department has become a beacon of excellence, just like the 34-year award, known for its transparency, accuracy, and accountability. Your ability to navigate complex financial landscapes and your keen eye for detail and sound judgment have consistently delivered positive outcomes for Lakeville. I want to express our gratitude and bid farewell to you and reflect on the contributions you've made to our city the last eight years, and your impact will be felt for many years to come. So on behalf of uh, myself and I get maybe the council too, um, I extend my deepest appreciation. Uh, may your retirement be filled with joy, relaxation, and new adventures. So thanks again for all the years of service to the city. Thank you very much for those kind words. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, we'll now move on to item six, the consent agenda. Mr. Miller, any items that you wanted to highlight? Thank you, Mayor. Two items of note, 6G is a proposal for professional services for the final design of Avonlea Community Park. Just wanted to be sure the community knows we're still moving forward with the park referendum projects, and this is one of those that's being funded. And then item 6O is approval of a purchase agreement of the Alter Alternative Learning Center property from ISD 194. That's the building right next to the Arts Center, and that's been a long time strategic priority for us, and so we're glad to see that moving forward. Okay, very good. Any items those on the council wanted to pull for further discussion? Okay, can I, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay, and is there a second? Yep. Okay, is there any further discussion about the consent agenda? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The consent agenda is passed. We will move on to item number seven, acknowledge receipt of the comprehensive financial report of the year. And that is Chris Kanopic, principal at Clifton Larson Allen. Oh, and yes. Gerilyn, you're back. <laughs> I came back. That was a very short retirement. <laughs> 
Um, I just wanted to mention, um, obviously, Chris is coming up here to present the, the audit results. Um, we had included draft copies, and we had made a couple of changes. Um, they're not material at all, but we will be um, able to send out the final document tomorrow. Yeah. Very good. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Council. I am here tonight to present the results for the December 31st, 2022 audit. Uh, we do have a PowerPoint that's switching over right now. Um, as we go through this, uh, similar to what we've done in the past, uh, feel free to ask questions as we go. Otherwise, there's obviously time at the end for questions as well. So uh, just going through some required communications. First off, the city is receiving an unmodified or a clean audit opinion. That is the highest level of assurance that any entity can receive, regardless of the type, whether you're, if you want to say, a, a public entity, nonprofit, publicly traded, unmodified is the goal that we set out to at the, at the start of the audit process. There is going to be a separate governance communication letter that the entire council receives. That goes through and details a lot of required um, kind of disclosures and things that we just have to make sure that we're that the council sees on an annual basis. Uh, everything from estimates to this year we adopted a new accounting standard, so we specifically call that out. We'd let you know if we had disagreements or difficulties in performing the audit, several different things like that. It's a, it becomes a very plain letter, which is a good thing in our world when we don't have any of those types of things. As far as internal controls go, our responsibility for them is, to, is not going to be providing opinions on internal controls. Our responsibility is to let those charged with governance know if we have anything that rises to either a material weakness or a significant deficiency. This year, you can see on your slide, both of them are saying we had no items identified this year. Uh, last year, we did have one significant deficiency. We're down to none again this year, which is uh, great to be able to report. We also look at the Minnesota Legal Compliance Guide. This is something that the Minnesota Office of the State Auditor requires us to look at on an annual basis. Uh, it's about 25, 30 pages. It covers uh, seven different areas for, for uh, municipal governments, anywhere from uh, deposits and investments, conflicts of interest, contracting and bidding, miscellaneous tax increment financing, and long-term debt. Uh, so we look at those different uh, seven different categories. We did not identify in our testing any compliance issues as well. This year, the city also did require a single audit under the uniform guidance. A single audit is required when a entity expends more than $750,000 in federal awards. This year, the, the city expended all of your ARPA or that coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery funds, that's the official grant name, in 2022. So this funding occurred in two different kind of tranches is what they said. The city received half in 2021, half in 2022, and it was 100% uh, expended in 2022. So we, have, we looked at that. That requires us to look at both controls around compliance as well as compliance with the requirements of that grant, and we did not have any comments related to either controls or compliance regarding that grant as well. So very positive for uh, an entity that does not receive a single audit very, very often to, to know that there were no findings in both of those should be some assurance for the council that uh, city staff and management have a, a dedication to making sure you're complying with everything. Now for the next several slides, we do have several different um, kind of financial results looking at these. The first one's looking here at some of the revenues for your general fund. So we're focusing a lot on the first few slides in your general fund because that is the main operating fund for the city. Uh, this year, a couple different things you'll note is the when we look at these as far as total revenues, and you'll see on the expenditure slides when we get there, total expenditures are growing as well as the city continues to grow. Uh, so what we like to look at is, are the proportions, are you having to rely on one type of funding more this year than last year or, or vice versa? So this year, your proportion related to property taxes, which is your main driver in the general fund, did decrease. That's going to be a one-time thing related to the city recognizing a little over $5 million in your ARPA award this year. So... If you take that back out of there and say that's not so that's just a one-time injection of funding, your proportion goes from 66 back over to 70% where it has historically been. So no concerns on that side as far as that goes. Uh, the one unique thing you're going to see on several of these slides this year is that kind of that small little yellow bar at the bottom. Uh, with the way the fair market value adjustments went this year for municipalities across the across Minnesota, across the country, 
you're going to see when you look at your final version of your financial statements, you might have saw it in your, in your drafts when you looked at it, you'll see a negative number for interest income this year. No concerns on our side, city's practices to hold all investments to maturity. It's just a temporary reduction that we're forced to record at year end, but it's not indicative of the city looking at having to take losses when they actually mature those investments. It's just a temporary reduction. So, As far as looking at the actual budget for the general fund, this year the, the general fund was under budget by $159,000, so about four-tenths of a percent. Biggest driver in that is just that uh, interest income. As you can see, it was a negative number this year. In the general fund, it was about almost $1.7 million. So you factor that and say even if it's zero, you're well over budget in the general fund. So biggest pieces, as they have been the last several years, license and permits and charges for services typically are two of your biggest areas where you're over budget. Combination of the city being conservative on budgeting for those items because they are really dependent upon uh, development continuing to happen, so that's okay to be conservative on that. And then also your property taxes were about 273000 over budget as well. Looking at the expenditure side now for the general fund, as I mentioned, this is another area where you can see it's continuing to grow year over year. It's up a little over 22% over the last five years. But we look at a lot of it as proportionality from year to year. And the one thing that is nice on here is even though the you want to say the pie is growing in total, each slice of the pie is staying pretty close to the same from year to year. So you're not having, you're not being artificially forced to, to sway money one way or the other without the council making a strategic decision to do that yourself. Likewise, looking at the results of the budget to actual for the general fund, the general fund, your budget actually can't, you're under budget by about $1.2 million this year. So about two and a half percent. Your biggest piece of that was your public works area. They were under budget by 550,000 or almost 10% under budget. And this year in the general fund, all of the significant departments were under budget. So um, very good for city management and staff continuing to monitor that and be diligent with your spending on the, in the general government or in the general fund. Uh, this is an area uh, we like to look at for all of our local governments is where are we sitting as far as fund balance reserves go? So we look at this a couple of different ways. Um, lots of information going on in this, but really the key is that green line that goes across the top. That tells you how much, of, how, what kind of percentage of coverage do we have of our expenditures at any point in time. So it looks both as of the current end of the year, December 31st, 2022, you had about, I think it's about 56.4%. It's a little bit tough to read on that slide. So that's based on unassigned fund balance in your general fund compared to your 2022 expenditure levels. So your fund balance policy is to be somewhere in that 40 to 50% range. So if you look at 2022 actual, a little bit over your fund balance policy. But when we project that out to say, what's that look like against our 2023 expenditure budget, you're right in the middle of it. So you come in at just over 44%. So you're pretty much square in the middle of your fund balance policy. So. Uh, you can see over the last couple of years, the city council has made a, a strategic decision to spend some of that fund balance down to get you back in compliance with your fund balance policy. These next couple of slides are gonna be looking at the, the utility funds as well as the liquor operations for the city. As you can see in here, um, a couple of different things. You have positive operating income, which is great. That means you're generating enough income from your day-to-day -day customers to pay for your on for operating expenses as well as you're fully covering all of your depreciation on an annual basis right now in your utility funds. That is a, a very good thing. It, it came down a little bit from last year, but you're covering over 100%. That's significantly better than a lot of local governments we work with where they might be covering anywhere from zero to maybe 50 or 60%. So the fact that you're covering 100% of it, that means you have current customers helping pay for the, for the uh, in actual installation and construction of those projects as well as also able to put some of that money away for future projects as well as the city continues to develop. In total, you have a, just about under $23 million in cash in that fund and you have a, typically an annual operating budget of a, a little over $20 million. So uh, sitting on very good reserves in that fund. Looking at the, the liquor operations for the city here, so your, your gross profit percentage, so that's just taking your your gross sales within your liquor stores, subtracting out what's the cost for those products. Uh, back in the, you know, several 
probably 5, 10, 15 years ago, we used to say anything above 25% when you're a pure off-sale liquor operation is typically really good. That's what you're aiming for. The city hasn't been that low since 2019. You're typically 26% or higher. This year, you continue to inch that gross profit up to about 26.9%. Um, the one thing to note on here is we do look at where the city compares to the seven county metro area for other municipalities that have um, off-sale liquor, uh, liquor operations. You, you are about a 1% lower than the rest of the metro area. Good or bad, you're still making a profit in that, but it at least gives you some comparison where you're at. We also call out a few other specific cities within there. Uh, and note that is for 2021, only because 2022 data is not available yet. So. Looking at your taxable market values for the, for the city, as you can see over the last couple of years, your taxable market value has uh, started to increase pretty, pretty rapidly. In 2022, your taxable market value is up to about $9.5 billion. It increased uh, $867 million from last year. So from uh, 2021 into 20, uh, yeah, into 2022, it increased $867 million, and you saw another significant increase into 2023 of going up uh, just over $2 billion in 2023 to $11.6 billion in taxable market value. So I think what you're seeing there is a lot of your development starting to come online in the city. They're finally clicking over through the, the, the county's assessment process. They're getting all their, all their valuations to where it's a more reasonable market value for them. Looking at your actual tax capacity and tax rates, um, typically what we see on here between your, your uh, capacity and your rate, they're typically an inverse relationship, so it's not unusual to see these kind of at opposite ends of your graph. Uh, the one thing to note on here when we are looking at your tax rate, we carve out just the city portion because that's what you can control. You can't control the county or watersheds or school districts or the mosquito control district, all those things. You're not able to control those, so focusing just on what the city can control itself. So in 2022, your tax capacity increased by about $9.2 million, so a pretty significant increase there and your tax rate actually decreased to 32.85% this year. So you've continued to see that decrease uh, slightly each year. We also do like to look at and see how does Lakeville compare to some of your surrounding communities, uh, both down in the South Metro as well as the other parts of the Metro as well. So what we typically do on this slide here is we, we look at it and say, what's the taxable market value for the median home in Lakeville? And then we say, what's your tax rate? And then we take the tax rate of all of the other communities in here and say, where does Lakeville measure up against these? And you can see, and this has been a pretty consistent slide over the last several years, is Lakeville's typically right in the middle. You're not, the, you're not gonna be the cheapest if you wanna say, and you're, not, you're definitely not the most expensive. So uh, very consistent as far as where Lakeville has uh, maintained in that slide. Now we're looking at some of your per capita results on here. This is looking at your revenues. Uh, we compare it to the December 31st, 2021 numbers because once again, that's the information that's available to us. Uh, really the biggest things that you're gonna look at in here is you know, how do we co really compare from year to year? So if we look at just purely 2021 statewide averages for and compare them to 2022, you're a little bit under the state average on a, as far as a per capita goes, but that's been the consistent theme for Lakeville ever since we've been working with you. It's a combination of whether it's franchise fees, it's a, a reduction, different types of property taxes. You're not, your property taxes aren't as high because your charges for services, your license and permits are typically higher than the statewide average. And then when you look at 2022 specifically, the biggest change there's gonna be that intergovernmental revenue number changed this year quite a bit. That once again goes back to that um, of the ARPA money that the city recognized this year of a little over $5 million. Um, I'm not gonna go through the laundry list of all of the different comparable cities, but a lot of these mirror the same ones we looked at on the tax rates. And it kind of just gives you a, a high level um, picture of where does Lakeville really you know, fit into the grand scheme of all of these different things. And you can see for the most part, you know, property taxes, tax increments, some of those types of things. You know, Lakeville stays, you know, pretty consistent with the statewide average also from year to year because there's 21 and 22 on here as well. 
where you start to see some of those numbers really fluctuate is where you start getting into intergovernmental revenues, charges for services, those types of things. You know, Lakeville doesn't get a you know all of the local government aid that all these some of these other cities get. Um, your charges for services, as I mentioned, with all the development going on, are typically quite a bit higher than most other communities. So. Uh, it's been pretty consistent year over year when we've done this graph as far as those, those are where your, you know, your different peaks and spikes are going. So, Looking at the expenditures on a per capita here, once again, these, the, the statewide average numbers are for December 31st of 2021. And what we really look at on here is, okay, how do we measure up against the rest of the, the, rest of the state for similar size cities? Uh, the biggest things you're gonna note is capital outlay is quite a bit more. Your, um, debt service is a little bit more, but not as you know significant. But really, what that's calling out is all of the development that's going on in Lakeville compared to other cities. You have a lot of land area down here that's still developable yet, developable, and it's, that development's happening. So it costs a lot of money to run the infrastructure, to do the roads, to do all of that type of stuff. So that is a it is a big driver of that. And then once again, to looking at the results when you compare those to your other cities, this is definitely mirroring those a little bit uh, closer compared to you don't have the, the inverses and the <coughs> different spikes on here. It's just Lakeville's numbers, their spikes are just a little bit higher than the comparable cities. And once again, that goes back to all of the development going on. These last couple slides, just looking at the actual uh, debt on a per capita or per household basis for Lakeville compared to others. Um, so you can see that yellow line going across the, the top, that's the, the per household average. And then the per capita is the green line down below that. And you can kind of see where does Lakeville measure up compared to other cities within the, within the metro area here. Lakeville with your debt, your debt um, numbers that you have are, are quite significant, but you're paying for that debt on an annual basis and you have a lot of development going on. So there's no concerns as far as the actual debt load of the city, but at least gives you some type of a comparison to where you're at with other communities. Uh, this is again looking at um, how does Lakeville compare? This is looking at cities, not necessarily all within Minnesota. We bring in some from outside. Uh, we did drop one city out of this list from last year. We used to have um, Caramel, Indiana in this as well, and their debt numbers were so far out of proportion compared to all these cities that it didn't really become a usable number. They were had something like a billion dollars in debt or something like that. So wasn't a very good, even though they're similar in population, it wasn't a similar situation. Um, so it didn't make sense to continue bringing them in because it did sway the numbers that much. So this just gives you that same comparison of where you're at with other um, measurables here as far as you're closer on the, the average per household, and per capita when you start to bring in other um, more developing cities around the country as well. And really just to kind of wrap this up now at the end, a couple of different items I just wanted to mention, you know, one, you are meeting your fund balance policy for the general fund, which is great. We had no internal control comments, no, no legal compliance, no single audit comments this year, which were always great to be able to report. Both, the, both of your enterprises, uh, funds, the utility funds plus the, the liquor fund are fully covering all of your depreciation. You're providing cash from operations, which is great. <coughs> the liquor fund this year transferred uh, about $1.3 million out of the liquor operations to fund various capital projects, debt service, general fund operations. That's great to see. That is, you know, the, that's the intention of having a liquor operation is to be able to help provide some of those additional resources in the city. And as Gerilyn had mentioned earlier, the city did uh, receive your uh, Certificate of Achievement for Financial Reporting for the 2021 audit. The 2022 audit will be submitted as well, but that is 34 consecutive years. And then finally, just as we've uh, historically done, just wanted to provide the council just a real uh, one, kind of a one-page thing of some of the new standards that are coming down over the next couple of years. Uh, the first one, these are actually all focused on 23. Um, the first one, Statement 96, related to subscription-based IT arrangements. Very similar to the lease standard that we just implemented this year, but this one's focused solely on the technology side. So software, cloud computing, those types of arrangements. So it's going to be another one where the city's already engaged with DebtBook to help go through that process, similar to what we did with the lease standard. So not anticipating a lot there. Outside of it just adds a little bit extra time for us to audit it on our side. 
Uh, the next two, we don't always call these out, but these are two um, fairly significant new auditing standards that we actually have to follow now coming out for the 2023 audit. So the auditing standards are something you follow regardless of type of entity. If you follow U.S. auditing standards, your firm's going to have to adopt these for 2023 audits. The first one, Statement 143, is just relating to accounting estimates. Right now, when it comes to our responsibility under accounting estimates for an audit, we make sure they're reasonable, they're supported, there's no management bias. It's kind of those three tests that we have to look at. Under uh, Statement 43, it's actually going to require us to do some additional actual substantive auditing for those estimates. It's going to include some additional note disclosures in the actual um, annual comprehensive financial report. Uh, the nice thing is in, in Minnesota, most of our local governments we work with, the estimates that we have to call estimates are pretty vanilla when you come when you think about it. It's useful lives of capital assets, our accounts receivable, collectible, our pension liability, post-employment benefit liability. So they're areas that we already audit pretty, pretty significantly anyways. So we're not expecting a whole lot of additional time on our side for that. It's more just updating note disclosures for it. Uh, statement uh, number 145, that one, it's got a very long name, but really what that one, if you want to get down to the nuts and bolts of it is, right now as auditors, we have the ability to, if you want to look at, if you think about your IT environment at any kind of uh, an entity, um, right now auditors can say we're going to either audit through that IT environment or around it. Auditors not being IT people, we typically default to around the environment because it's easier for us. Uh, statement 145 is actually going to force us to start going into the IT environment deeper. So all of the different systems that may impact your financial reporting, whether it's your general ledger, utility billing software, whatever that may be, it's going to force us to do some additional, um, one, just documentation around it, but also just using some of those if there's controls that are in place that are, um, that are usable through your IT environment, it's going to force us to start auditing some of those controls as well. But outside of that, I just want to thank uh, Geraldine, all of the city staff, uh, for helping us get through the audit process this year. Uh, adopting a new uh, governmental accounting standard related to leases is definitely a significant undertaking. Um, so we uh, really do thank all of the, the city staff for helping us get through the audit. So I'm open to any questions that any council members may have. Thank you so much. Questions, comments? I do have a question. Yep. So it's on your last <laughs> statement that you're going to be Auditing, <clears throat> I'm a little confused. Um, most entities already use technology to mm -hmm. be able to produce all the hard copies. So what is it that you're looking for? So right now when we, when we utilize the IT environment, so right now main, most of the time auditors rely on manual type control. So somebody's actually signing off and initialing an invoice. That's a control that we can that we can use. Sometimes there are some natural inherent controls that are built into your IT environment. Uh, say, you know, segregating out who can actually do different functions, who can actually physically cut a check out of your computer system, who can access certain types of files and those types of things. Right now, auditors, we typically decide to go around the environment and look at the more of the manual paper processes as opposed to saying we're going to rely on your IT environment and your controls that are built into your IT systems. With the new standard, we're going to have to start relying on some of those, some of those IT controls more significantly than what we have to now. It's actually going to force auditors to. Well, there will be some sort of checklist system to that? Yep. There's, uh, we're in the process right now, like most firms are, of developing what those um, different checklists and questionnaires and criteria are going to look like. Uh, for next year's audit, we're probably going to utilize one of our IT specialists from Minneapolis to come out and actually sit with, sit with members of your IT department to actually start to go through some of these and get a better understanding of your IT environment. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, if not, I'll take a motion to accept receipt of the report uh, mayor yes i move to acknowledge receipt of the city of lakeville annual comprehensive financial report for the year ended december 31 2022 second second okay. is there any further discussion about receiving the report okay all those in favor of the motion say aye aye aye, aye. opposed very good. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. We'll now move into item eight, 
Antlers Ridge, and I believe the developer, Mr. Herman. Yes. Welcome. Good evening. All right. Mayor, members of the council, thank you for your time tonight in reviewing our application. My name is Nate Herman with Atera Land Services. I am the project engineer and uh, the developer's representative. The application before you this evening is for a preliminary plat, a rezoning, and a conditional use permit for a 54-unit twin, twin building home development called Antlers Ridge. The applicant for this project is Tamarack Land Development out of Waconia, Minnesota. Some of the key factors that went into the design for the project were driven by the site zoning requirements in the Shoreland Overlay District. We believe the two-family housing product provides a nice transition from the townhome community to the south and the single-family community to the east, all while satisfying the density and the area requirements. The design for the proposed grades were driven by the existing sanitary sewer service stubs that service the property. To the extent possible, we minimize the, the amount of re fill required uh, while maintaining gravity sewer service to all the lots. As far as the project timeline goes, we currently have a grading permit that will allow us to import material. Once preliminary plat is approved, we will continue with the grading permit to grade the development and move into final plat application. We plan to grade the site in one phase, but expect the utility and street work to probably be split up into two phases. The intention is to finish the grading this year and uh, you know, more, like, more than likely move into public improvements next year. Uh, as far as builders goes, we have not solidified a builder for the project yet. Unfortunately, due to a tragic accident, the builder planned for this development uh, can no longer build the homes. Uh, but Tamarack, the developer, is in conversation with a couple other interested parties. Uh, nothing signed yet, but things are, are looking positive in, in that manner. Uh, we are aware of the architecture requirements within the city code, and we'll continue to work with city, city staff to make sure those are met. Um, I'll be around for any other questions. Very good. Thank you. Any questions at this point? Okay, if not, I believe Mr. Moore has a staff report. Thank you. Mr. Herman? Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, as was mentioned, this is the Antlers Ridge uh, project, which, as Mr. Herman said, uh, includes a preliminary plat of 54 twin home uh, lots, a rezoning uh, from RM2 to RST2 for a portion of the property and a conditional use permit for a shore impact plan. Here is the location uh, overlaid on the aerial photo. Um, as you can see, this particular development abuts two existing developments. To the south is the Spring, uh, Springbrook attached townhome development, and to the east is the Marion Village single family neighborhood. This uh, is related to the zoning, basically, basically the westerly half, approximately, or west portion of the property is currently zoned RM2. The east portion is zoned RST2. Uh, and the developer is proposing to rezone the west portion to RST2 to match the east side. And the RST2 district does allow the twin home unit development. So this uh, uh, rezoning would fit with the comprehensive plan and the densities uh, that would be allowed for this site as a whole. Here's a little bit closer look at the um, rezoning, the zoning of the surrounding properties. Uh, here is generally a very colorful uh, view of the preliminary plat. Um, again, 54 twin home unit lots. There's two outlots for stormwater ponding, wetlands areas, uh, outlot A here on the north side, and then a smaller outlot B, which connects to and will expand a stormwater ponding basin in the Springbrook uh, townhome development to accommodate stormwater runoff <coughs> for this project. A couple of things I do want to point out, the development includes the extension of 203rd Street, which was stubbed in with the Marion Village plat when that uh, was done uh, roughly 30 years ago. Uh, that neighborhood only has one uh, access point, and that's off of 205th Street. This will provide that neighborhood with a second access point. Uh, a little bit later than probably was anticipated at that time, but that'll give them an access out to uh, Kenrick Avenue. 
Also, Kensfield Trail uh, from the Springbrook townhome neighborhood. That was platted about 20 years ago. Uh, that will extend that public street to tie into 203rd Street. So there will be a, a number of access points that will serve not only Antlers Ridge development, but uh, the adjoining neighborhoods and will provide good neighborhood connectivity. I uh, do want to point out, and this came up uh, as part of the public hearing, the developer will be responsible for constructing turn lanes on Kenrick Avenue. There will be a northbound right turn lane into the site off of 203rd Street, uh, and then there will be a southbound left turn lane again into 203rd Street, the main access point at that location. Uh, landscaping, oh, this is, sorry, this is the grading plan. Landscaping will be installed at the perimeter of the site. You can see a good part of the focus is along the westerly side of the site adjacent to existing uses, which this location is Terra Products, the greenhouse use there. And over here is the Merrick Towing use. And then there's also perimeter landscaping along the east line adjacent to the uh, existing single family homes. Plus, there will be uh, landscaping installed at the front of the units and at the um, uh, foundation plantings for those units as well. And here's the phasing uh, that Mr. Herman referred to. Again, he indicated they're generally looking at two phases, uh, going from west to east with phase one coming in off of Kenrick and then phase two tying into 203rd Street and uh, Marion Village. The Planning Commission held a public hearing on the applications at their July 6th meeting and unanimously recommended approval subject to eight stipulations. There was public comment from three neighboring property owners and those comments were addressed by staff and the Planning Commission at the, the, um, at the hearing. The developer also hosted a neighborhood meeting uh, on April 13th that was attended by roughly 25 to 30 neighboring property owners as well. And the Parks, Recreation, and Natural Resources Committee uh, unanimously recommended approval of the preliminary plat at their July 5th meeting. So in summary, staff is recommending approval of the ordinance rezoning the property from RM2 to RST2, the resolution approving the preliminary plat, and the conditional use permit for a short impact plan and adoption of the findings of fact. And I can stand for questions. Very good. Any questions? Yeah, I just had a question about when the shoreland impact plan is looked at, is that, do we work with the DNR? How, do, how does that engineer just to make sure we're not having excessive runoff into like Marion or the watershed? How did, can you just give some background on that? Yeah, the shore impact plan is generally for developing properties that uh, are not single family. So single families exempt from that. Uh, because this is a twin home development, it was uh, required as a conditional use permit. The DNR was notified of the public hearing. They responded with no comments. And generally what it does is the shore impact plan conditional use permit wants to make sure that the proper uh, erosion control, uh, stormwater runoff, sediment control, these types of issues are being taken care of. Uh, obviously our requirements with the subdivision ordinance and the zoning ordinance for those submittals that you see with the grading plan, the erosion control plan that were submitted as part of the preliminary, preliminary plat cover that. So those have been reviewed by our engineering staff, our engineering as well, our, our, which are our consultants and all have signed off on those plans. Obviously when it gets to final plat, we'll get more detailed plans, which will be reviewed again at that time with each phase. Okay, very good. If there's no questions, I will entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, move the uh, council approves uh, one, an ordinance rezoning property from RM1, medium density residential district to RS2, RST2, single and two family residential district, and adoption of findings of fact. Uh, two, a resolution approving the preliminary plat of Antlers Ridge, and three, a conditional use permit and adoption of findings of fact for a shore impact plan. And is there a second? A second. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion? Okay, seeing none, Ms. Orlovsky, roll call, please. Folk? Aye. Aye. Fermel? Aye. 
Walter. All right, very good. Look forward to working with you guys. Congratulations. Now we'll move on to item number nine, and Mr. Mori is already on deck to get us out of here on time. <laughs> I move to be as brief as, as I possibly can. Uh, this is what we are calling round two of our annual subdivision and zoning ordinance amendment. I'll go through this relatively quickly. It's, it's fairly straightforward. You uh, approved the round one uh, amendments at your June 5th meeting. There's a couple of items that council referred back to the planning commission. I'll cover those in a moment. Uh, one, real quickly, one uh, area that we're looking is extending the deadline for final plats to be recorded right now. The ordinance says 100 days after city council approval, the final plat has to be recorded. We've noticed that lately, uh, especially now the last year or so with the economy, that developers are taking a little bit longer. So in conversations with the city attorney's office and, and staff, we agreed that bumping it to 180 days would be more fitting with what we're seeing right now. Uh, and extensions can be approved by the city council or regardless, but this gives them a little bit extra time before having to come back and ask for an extension from council. Uh, this is just related to uh, lot frontage for properties, uh, properties that may not have frontage on a public street, and you typically see that in our larger commercial areas. Um, the requirement for approval of those used to be a CUP or is currently a CUP and we're proposing to change that to an administrative permit. Um, staff is very familiar with working through these issues and the biggest issue is just making sure there's shared driveway access amongst the adjoining parcels so they can get out to the public street. We thought that might uh, change a little bit of red tape or reduce the red tape for those. Uh, signs within commercial and industrial districts while our Sign ordinance is content neutral. Uh, generally, we have a requirement for what are considered to be uh, directional signs uh, to direct uh, customers into a site. And they each uh, site is allowed two signs per access from a public street limited to six feet in height and 12 square feet in area. The ordinance requires a 15-foot setback from the right-of-way, which there could be another 15 feet of boulevard, so it could be quite a distance uh, that these signs are off of the public roadway and harder for uh, the traffic to see where to turn in. And we're uh, proposing to change that to a five-foot setback to get a little bit closer to the roadway and make those directional signs a little bit more effective. Um, this is related to language that was part of the round one um, ordinance update where we clarified some things regarding development density uh, and affordable housing language. There was sections, subsections that were incorrectly stated and some uh, density language that was redundant. And there was a, a few of the districts were inadvertently left out of the public hearing notice for round one we're including those in round two to make sure we're uniform across uh, our housing districts. Home occupations, this is one of the items that council directed uh, back to planning commission. The question that came up at that June 5th council meeting was what if you have a household that has two or three kids uh, and they're all going to the home occupation site at the same time to attend these instructional classes. I think the concern was if they're all coming together in the same car, you're not adding any traffic, you're not adding any parking. Uh, again, in, uh, at the recommendation of the city attorney, uh, we're proposing to revise that to up to three children from the same household, whereas before the proposal would have been one. Uh, this, is, this one's a little bit new since the round one public hearing notices went out. We have been getting some inquiries from uh, businesses that do cosmetic ta tattooing, and I have to admit I'm not an expert on this, uh, but it's, I guess they do it a lot in conjunction with beauty salons or barber shops, and the state licenses them the same as a regular tattoo parlor, uh, and tattoo parlors are uh, generally 
allowed as permitted uses in the higher C districts, C2, C3, for example, and the proposed amendment would allow uh, cosmetic tattooing, also known as micropigmentation, uh, as an accessory use to a barber or beauty salon in the OR, C1, and CCDD districts. So it would bring it more into line with state statute. Uh, this one was one that we um, noticed, and I don't know how, why that didn't get in the round one uh, public hearing notice, but in the C2 district, we allow motor vehicle sales with outdoor display more than 30%, which is most car dealerships. But we don't allow car rental agencies, you know, Hertz or, or Avis or whatever, and that would have a similar outdoor display of vehicles, and we felt that that was kind of a gap in our ordinance to not allow those as well in the C2 district, so we're just gonna add that uh, in along with motor vehicle sales. Uh, commercial kennel setback, this was the, this issue came up when the uh, pet suites uh, CUP came up in Timbercrest 10th edition, and there was a lot of discussion at the planning commission between where are we measuring the 500 foot setback requirement and uh, it was measured from, or way we are measuring it today is from the property line where the planning commission felt that, you know, it really should be more towards the outdoor exercise area because that's the area that potentially has the most impact on adja adjacent residential districts. So we did want to change that language to reflect the outdoor exercise area versus the property line. Uh, and that would be in the C2, C3, and OP districts. And then the other item that the council referred back to the Planning Commission was the commercial kennels in the OP district. Um, the council wanted the Planning Commission to reconsider that. I think at that meeting I had proposed the possibility of allowing a commercial kennel as a use accessory to a principal use in the OP district, much like the ordinance change that uh, for daycares, which we had daycares in the OP district as a accessory to another use, like an office use. And so that's what we propose with the commercial kennels in the OP district, the Planning Commission concurred, and so that's what our recommendation is for you this evening. That concludes my presentation. Uh, I should just mention that the Planning Commission did have a public hearing for the ordinance amendment and unanimously recommended approval at their June 15th meeting. Okay, any comments or questions? No? Okay, I just wanna thank you and the Planning Commission for kind of reviewing those things that we had. Quite a bit of discussion back uh, a couple of meetings ago, so I appreciate everybody for taking a look at that. So with that, I'll take a motion to approve. Go. Um, I'll move to approve an ordinance amending titles 10 and 11 of the city code and a summary ordinance for publication. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any further discussion? Okay, if not, uh, Ms. Rolofsky, uh, roll call please. Hellier? Aye. Bermel? Aye. Walter? Aye. Bolk? Aye. All right, very good. That passes and we'll move on to items 10 and 11, unfinished and new business. No? Okay, announcements are next. Regular meeting is August 7th here. Our next work session is next Monday, July 24th at the uh, water treatment facility on the corner of Ipava and 105th Street. And then a reminder that a national night out is August 1st. And with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. Good night.